Welcome back to the Artie Lang Show. Currently having a fun time ignoring Hansie's call. I've been doing that for about half an hour. So we're trying to keep <laughs> uh, anyway, the great John Avello is on, one of my favorite guests. We talk a little tournament, maybe some future baseball bets. My buddy just went out there. I want to ask him his opinion on that. But let's uh, let's get into the tournament. Uh, John Avello, what's up, buddy? Hey, Mr. Lang. I'm doing well. Thanks. Uh, so, listen, one of our employees, by the way, one of our producers, a guy who uh, helps run the show, Eric Jones, going out to Vegas, and he's going to be the first guy here to, to... I haven't done a gig in Vegas since I've known John, which is odd. I always went there. Uh, you got to take care of our buddy, man. He's going to come say hi to you. John, looking Eric Jones. Forward, looking forward to seeing him. We already talked before the show, and I'll see him sometime probably around the final game on Monday night. Now, listen, if I give Eric Jones 10 dimes to spread around, okay... And I'm gonna, and I say, leave it up to John Avello. It's it's ten G's. You can put it all on one. You could put five, two dime bets, ten one dime bets. Do you think is that something you want to do or are allowed to do or you don't have time to do? Uh, I'm gonna send Eric to the club, right? To with his ten dimes, and my advice is gonna be to get a couple of bottles and a table, <laughs> and find, it, find a couple of nice women, and and. So you so you're saying he, so you're saying he should take my ten thousand dollars and spend it on whores. <laughs> I didn't say that. Sort of, that's what he said. You interpreted that to, to be that. Uh, I no. want well, you know what, John? We're friends. We've known each other a while. If I give ten G's to Eric Jones, I, I just want to give me a little advice on one bet for ten grand. I can't, Artie, because... <laughs> I know. Um, I'm kidding, all right. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I can't. You know, I've been, I've been making the numbers on every, 60... I've made 60 numbers and 60 totals so far on this NCAA tournament. Okay. And they've been so good. I mean, the games have been so tight. Amazing. Right to the numbers. Yeah. So I'm not... I'm not any good of a handicapper. I mean, I'm a really good odds maker, but as far as having to pick the winner, as strange as it sounds, I'm... I'm no better than the next guy. So I, I can't give you any advice on where to go. I'm busting your chops. But I may, I may look at the lines and, 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 give, and give him some cash. But uh, I hope I can trust Eric Jones. I've done this. I've given a stripper 10 grand before to go out there, and she has never returned. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that makes sense. Eric yeah, Jones. right. Eric, though, is an employee here. Eric's I, I, different than I, a stripper. Eric, Eric Jones. will be coming back. I'd like to think he's different than yeah. a stripper. Yeah. Eric is loyal. Oh, maybe. Uh, so <laughs> maybe. let's talk about this. We just had a guy, basketball basketball expert, uh, uh, you know, who knows who's an expert, but it's a guy whose opinion I trust. He likes Wisconsin. He thinks Florida is an absolute lock. What do you think about that? Uh, I, You know, I think Wisconsin's worth looking at. Uh, th- this is, this is going to be a tight game, of course, and Kentucky's a one-point favorite in the game. You know, Kentucky's done everything right in the tournament, but – I think he likes Wisconsin because if you look at the last four teams that are left, I think there's no team that plays better as an overall team than Wisconsin. Okay. So their team basketball, Kentucky could be more of a you know show show off kind of game, one on one type of game team. But I, I understand why he likes Wisconsin. It makes a little sense to me. So let's uh let's just get this straight before I let you go on this. I can interpret that as you saying Artie bet ten thousand dollars <laughs> on Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> no, Wisconsin has a seven footer who can shoot from the outside in college. That's unreal. Uh they have really good players yeah. all around. I mean Kaminsky, uh Brust, uh Decker, I mean, they got guys that are just solid players. And what I like about them is they really bang the boards well on offense, the offensive boards. That's but huge. Yeah. As well as they've done on the offensive boards, this is a team that they're playing that does a better job than any team in the tournament on the offensive boards. So that's where their problem lies. So I would suggest that they make the shot instead of trying to get <laughs> the second shot. Well, you know, when I, when I would try to handicap college hoops because i did better when i gambled quite a bit when i was in my mid-20s i i I did that my best uh, work was with college basketball and when i would attempt to handicap the games i the stat i'd look at the most were offensive rebounds if you're really dominant with that and have the capability of being dominant with offensive rebounds in a college game and and correct mistakes and put back you Mm -hmm. you that's a huge thing i think especially in college 
I agree, and Kentucky's done no better job than anybody. In, they, they, out of everybody in the tournament, they've done the best job with that. Yeah. The thing is with Kentucky, yeah, they're getting a ton of offensive rebounds, but that Wisconsin group, you got juniors and seniors that are playing with more pride and I more experience, and they're deal. playing defense. You know, they're playing better team defense. Well, yeah, at this, at this point, the experience is big, you know, right? Don't you think that's another advantage that Kentucky doesn't uh, no have? No question. I mean, Kentucky, yeah. you're, you still got a every – te- every guy in the team's probably uh, – 18. You know, yeah, they're, they're kids. In a, yeah. in their first 30 30- – something games of college and uh and it's gonna be their last 30 something games of college. right yeah right now what about florida you think that I, I happen to agree i think that's a lock i don't know about the lock but i you know one one advantage i can tell you that connecticut had and i don't know if a lot of people really noticed it but you know connecticut beat iowa state and they beat michigan state and they beat both of those teams in new york and nobody's played more in Madison Square Garden than Connecticut. Yeah. They probably had six, eight games there this year. And that team's played in Madison Square Garden just a ton of times through the years, whereas other teams haven't. So I thought they had a somewhat home. I'm not going to give them a full home at field advantage, but they're very comfortable uh, in that place to play basketball. Now, this is a real neutral court. You know, one one thing I'm really going to look at on this uh, when these games start, you know, and the first game is going to be um, at, I think the first game starts at three o'clock. Mm-hmm. And one thing I'm going to be totally aware of is I remember back in 2011 when Connecticut won the national championship, those games were played at Reliant Stadium in Houston. And for some reason, the stadium was so big uh, and the court was. Uh, far away from the stand. Bad for basketball. The perception for the shooters was not good. It yeah. was really low-scoring uh-huh. games. And I'm going to really take a good look at that early to see if that's going to be the same with AT&T Stadium as it was with Reliant. Wow. Stadium. I agree with you. That's not uh, The more intimate, the better for basketball. Even in the pros, you know, those uh, 89-90 Detroit Pistons teams that dominated with defense were low-scoring games. Now, they played great D, but they also played in the Pontiac Silverdome where the Lions played. And a lot of people thought that was true back then, that the games were low-scoring because – you know, the people that were playing, too. It's just, it was weird. It's a bad perception. You know, I've, I've been uh, involved in games, football games, where the stands, the color of the stands alone affects how you perceive the ball in the air. There were places like, I'm sure. like the old Cowboys Stadium. Yeah. That was, it, for whatever reason, it was really hard for me to catch a, a ball in the flat there. Mm-hmm. Like, I had to really focus in on that thing. And it just it messed with your eyes. Uh, Different things like that uh, and hoops, really I, I, do make a difference. No, I, I agree with John uh, with the with the hoops especially. Like uh, John, uh, like how much has that affected a line? That factor. Uh, well, you know, as, as far as the line goes, both teams have to play on the same court. As far as the totals concerned, um, that's what I'm really going to take a hard look at in that first game. Yeah, it hurts that, the under over. Yeah, the first game is 126 and a half to total. That's not a lot of points to begin. You know. Connecticut loves to use a lot of the clock, and and Florida will play that same type of slowdown game. If that's low. One one twenty six and a half. That is low. That's low. That really is low. That just shows you that the type of game this could be. And if it's one of those games where the guys can't get a you know a good handle on uh, you know shooting because of the perception, that could even make the the score go lower. So we'll know early. We'll, I think we'll know a lot in that first game. Uh, you know, where the next two games are going to fall. You see, this is why gambling to get your juices going. God, I, God, I'd love to put about 50K on the over right there. <laughs> oh, 126 and a hook and watch that screw me. I, um, I, you know, listen, I don't know. I, I, uh, I have a couple of my buddies went out to Vegas. They made some future bets. They always like to make future bets in baseball. And my one buddy bet the over in wins, the Miami Marlins. I don't, I don't know where he came up with this. I think he gets 68 and a half or something like that. He tried to explain it to me. I don't know. What do you think of that bet? Well, over, it over. Looks good right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, Miami out of the box is playing pretty good baseball. Uh, yeah, but you have to sustain it and you have to uh, you make sure that you don't have a lot of injuries. So pitching wise, they seem to be okay. Um, 68 and a half, I, I would, I mean, if I could if make that bet now, I'd say he's got the best of it. If I, you know, but, you know, we'll see what happens as the season goes on. Right. Let's face it, the, the division that they're in, uh, there's probably one one and a half teams in there. When I say one and a half, I think there's the Nationals and then there's the Braves and then everybody else is an also-ran. So, 
you know, maybe they can beat up on the rest of the division. Um, you know, so but that's where they might get the bulk of their wins. Mm. Uh, you know, I don't know if I ever ask you this, but I'm not talking about what what uh, time of the year you write the most action or whatever. I'm just talking about you personally, your favorite time to be in Vegas. Is it Final Four? Is it Super Bowl? Is it still a big fight? Like, of those things, or something I'm not thinking of, uh, when's your favorite time to be in Las Vegas sporting-wise? I think you, you mentioned some all of those times already. I mean, I just love the, the entire tournament. Um, yeah. I love... That's my favorite. I, you know, I love the, the Super Bowl. It's a great time. Next weekend, we got a big fight in town, Pacquiao. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, fight weekend is also... You know, exciting time to be there. Gets the juices, as you say. Yeah. yeah. What about um, divisional weekend in the NFL? Another big one. That's yeah. huge. I, you know, I just, That's fun, I, too. I guess if you're if you're in the business, you consider yourself lucky to be part of something that you, you really enjoy. And I think uh, that's why we, you know, all of us that are in the business are just, no matter what the season is, we, we really do enjoy it all. I was living in L.A. for Tyson Holyfield 1. And uh, I got uh, Quincy Jones, who was producing Mad TV, got me and a couple of my buddies on the show, uh, eighth row, nearly ringside for Tyson and Holyfield won. And uh, we went early, a day early, had the tickets. God, that was insane. That, that was the, to be in Vegas for that weekend. We stayed at the Mirage. That was a big, big fight. And those are getting less and less. You know, the fighting's, I, I hope, comes back strong, but. Uh, that's a cool time, too. Oh, I think so. You go back. I remember going to some of the fights at Caesars, you know, the Hagler, Leonard's, and some of the some of the best heavyweight fights that this town has ever seen. Now, those days, like you say, are gone. First of all, the heavyweight division, we haven't had a heavyweight fight in town here in years. Non-existent. Not, right. And so, you know, it's Mayweather and Pacquiao kind of picking up the slack in boxing. And then UFC now is uh, every weekend we have a, you know, multiple right. fight fights, yeah. and that's kind of been, uh, you know, that's where our bets have actually been coming in in the boxing game because uh, just boxing is not what it once was. Yeah, Danny, hey. Danny Falata wants to ask you a question. John, I have a two-part question, much like they asked the president. My first part is, have you ever taken a two-week vacation, <laughs> and when do you take your family on vacation? Uh, two weeks I took, I went to Italy two years ago, so that was two weeks. Um, but I'm never, <laughs> yeah. if you're asking if I'm getting total peace and quiet for two weeks, that has never happened. Yeah, uh, because it's a good question, Dan. Ringing, yeah, there's something, there's something they need me for. And um, so I have never had two weeks of vacation without getting emails, phone calls, what have you. No. Mm. But, you know, what I do now is I, I have to pick my spots. Uh, after the, the championship game, you know, I'll leave for a while and then I'll, and then I'll come back and I'll get through the NBA playoffs and the Triple Crown. And then when there's a lull, then I'll take off again. So I have to, and the summer is another good time for me to get away. So I have to pick my spots because I'm locked in from September to, you know, through March. I am just totally <laughs> locked in. Absolutely. Hey, John, how bad did it mess with you? The, the just Kentucky season, you know, they start the year number one and then they drop all the way to unranked. They're an eight seed in the tournament. How bad did that mess with your numbers? How bad did that team mess with your mind? That actually was it was good for me in one sense, and I'll tell you why that was. When Kentucky opened up the season, uh, and I opened up the future book for the following year about a week after the tournament, so I'll open it up next week. No next kidding. Week. You do it that yeah, quick? I do wow. it that quick. That's a turnaround, see, man. Yeah. I go and see who has who coming back and what new players are coming in and and so I gauge it by that, and then I have to really keep a close eye on it. But back to your question was when Kentucky, when I opened up last year, Kentucky, I opened Kentucky about five or six to one, and I just took a bunch of money on Kentucky. Everybody was betting them like, you know, they, they already won it. And so then as the year went on, it didn't look like Kentucky was going to make much noise and, you know, maybe get to the tournament and possibly win a game or so. Mm -hmm. So everybody laid off of Kentucky, and so I was able to, raise the rods and take money on other teams and therefore I was able to um, not 
have a loss on on the wildcat. So therefore, mm. in one respect, it was good for me that they cooled off because people stopped betting them. No, uh, yeah. everybody didn't turn to Florida. Of That's a good question, John. They're an odd yeah. team because they're young and it's been up and down. John, listen, take care, of Eric Jones, and uh, I expect to be ten uh, k richer next week. <laughs> <laughs> now, honestly, Eric's going to say hi. Eric's going to say hi, and uh, we appreciate you, buddy. We'll talk to you real soon. All right, guys. Thanks. Thanks Bye. John. Great, John Avello. When we get back. Do not change that dial. Talk about a big fight weekend. Bisconti Bachetti, butting heads. Ladies and gentlemen, Bachetti's going to teach Gino Bisconti a little show business wizardry. The fur's going to fly. He, he brings it on to himself. Mike, stop. Well, Whoa. Mike, stop. Back in. The Artie Lang Show, weeknights on audience, only on DirecTV.